drop, drop it on the random. What up, y'all? Welcome to another episode of That Time in Hip Hop, a podcast about the history, the nostalgia, but more importantly, the preservation of hip hop music and culture. I am your host, Vegas of Hip Hop Now Podcast. With me, as always, the homie tone of IntoTheDome.com. What's good, brother? Hey, man, we had a little hiatus, man. Good to see you, brother. And I'm drinking some cayenne, ginger, and turmeric. Feeling good, man. If you're listening or watching for the very first time, uh, this is a podcast, a video podcast, a video show, YouTube show, whatever you want to say, um, where we talk about hip hop and we talk about the history and events, whether that be albums or artists or the you know 1995 Source Awards, whatever it may be, we've talked about it. We have a number of shows already in the can where you can watch the videos or you can listen to the audio. Uh, online on iTunes or whatever. Uh, but the last episode we did was about Mace, that time in hip hop when Mace left hip hop. Me and Tone go through the, the the events that led up to it, the history of Mace, his status at the time, his com- various comebacks, and, uh, and where he stood today in hip hop. So check that out right here on the B Row Network. And right now, we're going to do something we like to call this week in hip hop and in this week in hip hop july 1st 1982 grandmaster flash and the furious five dropped the message i mean i almost it almost feels stupid to just say classic there has to be a different word it has to be a higher word than classic when it comes to that because uh it it's it's probably the beginning of serious conscious hip hop mm. you know it's just one of those timeless records where the lyrics and the song itself was so impactful you know you don't just blindly say oh this is a jam and you you know you recite it but you don't pay attention it really made you pay attention uh to what was being said and you know for for people who weren't older around that time or even wasn't born in 1982 uh gives you a snapshot of what was going on what were adults or teens at that time dealing with uh with with drug abuse and and what hip-hop was doing in the early days tone grandmaster flash and furious five the message man your memories your thoughts on that classic record man how do you even articulate the message. I mean, I remember being, I was, I was a young, young guy. My brother, I always tell the same stories in terms of when I think of early 80s hip hop, my brother was DJing little parties in the neighborhood. He's seven years older than me. So he taught me everything I know about hip hop. He taught me how to scratch. I learned how to scratch on a Run DMC album, you know. But when he played Grandmaster Flash and Mail to Mail, the message, even me being young, it didn't sound like the yes, yes, y'all records that I was hearing at the time that he was playing, I was like, this, man, this kind of serious. And then when I saw the video, you know, it's showing the inner city of New York. It's showing the streets. It's showing a vivid picture of what uh, Mel and Mel and, and, and the other guys from Grandmaster Flash were, were talking about. And I mean, classic is not even a word. Legendary is not a word. The message is hip hop. It's a picture of what hip hop looked like, what the inner city looked like, is culture. That mm. song is culture. You know what I'm saying? That's the way you have to describe that. Uh, and there's a lot of polls over the last 40 plus years of hip hop, and that song is always looked at as, if not the greatest rap song of all time, it's always right there in the discussion of the top two or three greatest songs in this genre. You know, what mm-hmm. I mean, maybe maybe one of the greatest songs in the genre of of of, well, of black culture in America. Um, I mean, you know, the '80s drugs, Iran Contra, Reagan era, everything. That song vividly described that. I mean, a child is born with no state of mind, blind to the ways of mankind. I mean, you know what Melly Mel did with his verses on there put him into that first lyrical trilogy of Kings with Grandmaster Kaz mm. and Kumo D. So for anyone younger who want to learn their hip hop history, 
before the trilogies of the quote unquote golden era of Rakim, KRS One, and Big Daddy Kane, you had Grandmaster Kaz, Melly Mel, and Cool Mo D. Yeah. Um, and just real quick, recently, uh, LL Cool J was on, he was on one of Mike Tyson's podcasts, and Mike was asking him how he got into hip hop. And the funny thing was, one of the people that he named was Cool Mo D and the Treacherous Three as his influences. And people know that LL and Mo D had their battles, but Mo D was one of the reasons why LL was rhyming. You know what I mean? So it's kind of cool in retrospect hearing LL talk about that. You know, Big Daddy Kane talked about Grandmaster Cass being his influence. Jay Z talked about Grandmaster Cass. He talked about getting them back for what he did to the Cold Crush Brothers. So, you know, Mel and Mel goes back to that era, man, of just bringing the full circle of the first era of we recognize these lyrics, we recognize the vivid nature of these songs that. End up being something that inspired your slick wicks, your biggies, your nods, your ice cubes, your scarface, these storytellers. You know, Mel and Mel did that, and then the, the, the crew did that with the message, man. And I'm sorry for just going along, you know, along with this, but it's just I'm just thinking of the words to describe the feeling, even when you listen to it right now and yeah. watch the video, man. It's just 1982, it's 2019, and I can promise any listener that. The message is just as important right now mm -hmm. as it was in 1982, man. So salute to that amazing, legendary song that's been sampled several times by people like Puff and other people. It's just an amazing moment where hip hop no longer was going to be, you know, rappers delight and, and hip hop, hippity hop, whatever. No, once once they drop the message, it's like, well, maybe this is not a, not a fad. Yeah, you know, these kinda, guys are poetic and vivid, man. Yeah, it kind of became, kind of became a tool. You know what I'm saying? Um, like, it, it sound like there was more you can do with MCing than co rock a party. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely, that, absolutely. That, that's exactly what it was about back then. Like around that time, I know for me, like first of all, you know, um, that's exactly how New York looked once upon mm -hmm. a time. Uh, I remember that, even though in 1982 I was what five, maybe six, um, when it's dropped. And I remember, you know, as much as we talk about hip hop now and it's identified as this, that, and the third, and all these rules and regulations and stuff, back then it was just music. You know what I'm saying? And it was I knew, you know, they weren't singing. But it was something about it that was different that, you know, that I really liked. And I remember, you know, as I got older and I, you know, absorbed those lyrics a little bit more, you know, it was like, damn, this record is like really deep. And then they cleaned up New York probably in the late 80s, or early 90s. So like all like really the hood. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so a lot of those, you know buildings that were demolished but they left the bricks and stuff a lot of that look started to go away um so when i would see those videos it will remind me of a time that i could barely remember because you know that's what new york used to look like like when you watch uh netflix series the get down and they show them like kind of hanging out and running through like these demolished bricks everywhere and that's what, what kind of makes the message uh, especially when you watch the video, that's what drives the message home. Uh, no pun intended, but because it's it's a reality. It's the same difference as The Wire. You know what I'm saying? Uh, them talking about the ghetto and you know, and this is in the ghetto and there's drugs and stuff, but it's not a set. <laughs> you know, when you see them hanging in them alleys on The Wire, it's not a set. It's real neighborhoods they're just filming in. Um, so that's kind of what how the message was like. Tone said, man, it's an undeniable classic record, one of the greatest hip hop songs, if not one of the greatest songs of all time. And uh, fun fact, Melly Mel used to live two blocks from me. I would see him all the time, whether it was on my block or on his block. It was unmistakable because he was built like the ultimate warrior. Uh, so. <laughs> And he would be outside with no shirt on, so you knew it's like it's Melly Mel, like you know what I'm saying. Yeah. And and he was a huge star, 
but yet he was living in the projects or he was hanging around them one or the other. Uh, so that speaks a lot to hip hop also, especially back then and how dudes were earning or whatever. Uh, but yeah, again, classic record, man. All right. Uh, moving along though, we're going to get into the topic at hand and tone. We're here to celebrate a brother who did a lot in the game for hip hop, for Atlanta, for music in general. And people tend to forget about him. Like he didn't do what he did. And like, like we discussed off camera, you know, he has an interesting story, man. So tell the people what we had to talk about. Man, look, babe, I'm excited to talk about the one and only JD, Jermaine Dupree. Because it's funny because we think about Suge Knight and Puff and Russell Simmons and all of these guys, these major players in the game. And that like Jermaine Dupree is not on that same level. He has people listen. Jermaine Dupree is no less than your Puffs and your Suge Knights and all of these guys, man. What he did for Southern hip hop, hip hop in general, and music overall can never be overlooked, man. And, and for Jermaine Dupree, is a hip hop head as well. And we'll get into some of that, but he's been around hip hop his whole life. His father was an executive and talent scout for Columbia Records. Jermaine Dupri used to dance with Houdini. If you go back yeah. and watch like, the freaks come out at night, he's on there dancing. You know what I'm saying? As a, as a kid, he was on tour with them. He's been around hip hop and music his entire life. You know what I mean? And for some reason, people think that the South started when Andre said the South got something to say at the Source Awards. But mm. no, sir. Years before that, Jermaine Dupree was planting a seed in Atlanta and making Atlanta become a major player in the history of hip hop. You, yeah. you know, he started from he grassroots, man. You know, he he's in a mall. He sees these two kids. They turn out to be he created Chris Cross. He wrote the songs. He produced the songs. Everyone remember Jump and Mr. Bus and all of this stuff like that. They had several platinum albums. They start. He had them wearing their jeans backwards. People started wearing their jeans backwards all over the country. You know yeah. what I'm saying? He starts so so deaf around '93, and he of course he gets escape, and they become huge stars. And he at some point he gets jagged edge, and all he's working with all of these artists, but he also found other groups, you know, that was in hip hop. So I mean, it's just one of them things where he finds Bow Wow. He's giving him Bow Wow from Snoop and Suge now. Yeah. You know, Bow Wow becomes this mega star as a kid, multi platinum. You know, Jermaine is writing these songs, producing these songs for Bow Wow. At the same time, you know, Chris Cross had this huge mark. He gets the brat at some point and she becomes the first female that goes platinum and functified. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And just another tidbit, real quick, just to give some perspective. Jermaine Dupri is also one of the few people who work with Biggie, Jay-Z, and Nas. Yeah. Y y you know, he has turned it out on 1472 that you have in the background here. Mm -hmm. He did that B-size with Biggie and Puff and the Brat and everyone. He does Money Ain't a Thing and produces that for Jay-Z. It's on Volume 2 and yeah. it's out. It too. You see it's what I'm saying? So he's these are hits. Money and the Thing was a hit mm -hmm. in the club. You know what I'm saying? B side was an underground drunk, was an underground classic, but Money and the Thing was a huge hit in the clubs. I just wanted to bring that up as well, just to give you perspective that Jermaine Dupree wasn't just Atlanta, wasn't just the South. His movement also garnered the attention again of of, of Bad Boy because he did the joint with, with with the B side with Jay Z Rockefeller. And with Nas, you see what I'm saying? He he had several songs with Nas. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So that just shows you that he reached out from the South to the Upper East Coast to New York. He was respected on the West Coast. When Puff and Suge had that incident down in Atlanta, it was at Jermaine the Priest party. Yeah. So he had, yeah. he had he had ties with Suge Knight. He was friends with Snoop. You know, so his his reach was was nationwide at the time. You know what I'm saying? He produced yeah. and worked with people from east to west to and to, to the north. You know what I'm saying? To New York where you are. So 
it's just so easy to overlook what Jermaine Dupri has done and meant. We're talking about millions and millions of records sold. We're talking about influence. We're talking about the first. I mean, you could consider Jermaine Dupri uh, the godfather of of the, of Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then and then over you know almost ten years after he started So So Death, he does the classic track "Welcome to Atlanta" with Ludacris. And it becomes the Atlanta theme song that everyone who's important in Atlanta was on the video. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So these are just my initial thoughts, and we'll get into some more details, Vague. But just tell me your thoughts when you think of Jermaine Dupree, man. When I think of Jermaine Dupree, man, um, I didn't even honestly, I didn't even think of Atlanta. Because I mm. I thought of him in the same vein as as Puff. As Herbie Lovebug, as Teddy wow. Riley, you know what I'm saying? Like these dudes that not only produce and and like basically A and R these artists and and see them through the hits, um, but are just geniuses, you know what I'm saying? And and know the business and obviously knows how to get deals done and and, and opportunities, like you said, to be able to collaborate with so many different people. Like I remember. Um, he had the so so deaf remix to to Biggie's One More Chance, and it was dope because it was so different from the other one where it complemented it from the uh, original. It um, well, not the original, but the the remix that we all know with the uh, the bar sample. Uh, but the Jermaine Dupri version was just as smooth, just as dope. It was it was a so so deaf flavor. Um, and again, like you said, the songs with, with Jay-Z and, and others, like it just showed me that this was a dude who knew what he was doing um, from crisscross to to the brat, to escape, to working with Usher, all, like all of it, you know what I'm saying? Like this dude knew what he was doing. Um, like I remember when crisscross came out, right? Um, and, um, Again, I didn't think like obviously they had Knicks and Yankees jerseys on, but I didn't assume they were from New York. They were just like the new group that was out. And I just remember, man, like feeling like, damn, you know, I didn't know Jermaine Dupree wrote their rhymes at the time, but feeling like, damn, these, these, this song is crazy. And then to have someone like Bow Wow, because we know like Criss Cross was big, like they, the first album was crazy. Second album did well, but not as well. And so he gets Bow Wow, and it's like he gets a do-over. And with Bow Wow, he's just out of here. Like, he yeah. he nailed it every time. Um, and it was just perfect. And then, like, having the brat be a part of not only as an artist, but be a part of that rating team to kind of keep. He was just a smart businessman, man. He knew how to keep the machine going. Um, so when I think of Jermaine Dupri, man, I think of one of the, the greatest in hip hop business to ever do it in a game. And he deserves way more props than he gets, um, and, or at least yeah. just to be remembered. You know what I'm saying? And you know what, too? Just real quick, because we kept we equated him with Puff a few times. But just for some perspective for the listeners, Jermaine Dupri was a writer. OK, so when yeah. you heard some of his verses, he wrote his verses. So we heard uh, again a lot of the early crisscross records and 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 things like that. He wrote these Bow Wow. He wrote those songs. And just to show you even further his range, you know, Jermaine Dupri produced and wrote My Way. He produced he produced and wrote a lot of confessions, which most people in the music industry and and uh and just music pundits say that's Usher's best album. And it's yeah. a classic R&B album with the Confessions 2 song, Jermaine Dupri produced and wrote. You know, he wrote a lot of Usher's music. He wrote for Mariah Carey. He wrote, he wrote and worked with Aretha Franklin and Whitney Houston and all of these people. So just letting you know that it's bigger than hip hop. But since this is a hip hop podcast, make no mistake about it, Jermaine Dupri is also a hip hop head. Again, we're talking about someone who was dancing with Houdini all the way up to working with Jay-Z. So his his years in the game and in the culture, you know, can't be overlooked. Like he, he's not a fly by night person. He loves hip hop. He's done a lot for hip hop. So just letting you know that when you see him on Welcome to Atlanta, like I said, with Ludacris on the video, he's rhyming. Oh, he writes his own stuff too. 
And he's a he's a writer yeah. at heart. He writes songs. He writes R and B hits. He writes hip hop hits because at the end of the day, Bow Wow has platinum hits. Criss Cross has platinum hits. He wrote those songs. He created those images for Criss Cross, and he has he assisted in taking Bow Wow's image to another level. So, you know, we can't we can't push that aside like it's not a big deal. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, I mean it's one of the things where, you know, I think that for whatever reason people looked at him like he's a character of himself and he's really not. He's always been authentic. He's always been the same. If you listen to some interviews with Jermaine Pre from way back then to now, he always had vision. He always respected hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I don't think he ever tried to make a mockery out of hip hop. Whether you rock with some of the stuff he did or you didn't rock with it. I always felt like he was authentic with what he was trying to do with the artists he was working with, man. Yeah, and that's and again, that's where the parallels were where people like Puff go. Because it's it's sort of the same thing. Like, you know, you even if we just leave it in Atlanta, you know what I'm saying? There are people who wanna associate Atlanta hip hop with Outkast and Goody Mob and Ludacris and T.I. and you know what I'm saying? Like, like no, that's the hip hop. And they treat Domaine Dupree like it was some bubblegum stuff. When in fact, like you said, this dude is deeply rooted in hip hop. He, he writes it. He's collaborated with many people that are respected. It was the same thing with Puff. You know what I'm saying? He in New York, you know, after he was popping, but there was a certain sect of hip hop fans who did not like what he was doing, did not like the shiny suits and stuff like that, but blatantly ignored the fact that he didn't change Biggie's lyrics. He didn't change the locks lyrics or Black Rob's lyrics. Right. These dudes were still spitting. So it wasn't about changing the hip hop artist. It was more so like making the music inviting so that you can come in, so that more people can come into hip hop. And some people don't like that, but with Jermaine Dupree, um, like you said, it's kind of like they look at him like he's a character, but Jermaine Dupree has been putting in work and continue to put in work. Like, if we even just fast forward real quick, remember Mariah Carey had fell off. Like, mm -hmm. completely fell off after that whack movie, can't remember the name of it, that came with a whack album. Yeah, it was Jermaine terrible. Dupree, it was, uh... What was it, like, oh Glee God. or Sparkle, some something that was terrible that's been buried for years. It was. I'm on it was, it up it was, on it was terrible, so it doesn't even matter. Yeah, yeah. But Jermaine Dupri did her next album, and she blew up all over again. The Almost Emancipation of Mimi. Again. What's that? The Emancipation of Mimi. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's my Rod album that was quite whatever platinum, and Jermaine Dupri mm -hmm. had his hand straight in the middle. Of that album as a writer and producer, he actually exactly. I mean, you could. It's safe to say, you could assume that Jermaine Dupri saved her career. He absolutely did. I mean, it was dead. It was dead in the water, and we know it's not hip hop, but it's a prime example of a guy who knows what he's doing, and it's rooted in hip hop. Like Tone said, uh, him being a dancer. For Houdini, one of the the you know the, the legendary rap groups of the past of the eighties, you know what I'm saying? And there's Jermaine Dupri in there, freaks come out at night video, pop locking in the camera, looking mad young. Years later, you see him, you know, with Criss Cross and TLC, and even that dude MC Brains. You remember him? I have a single in here because I bought that. Yeah, single. MC, MC Brains, I think, was from 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 Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah, that single. I like that single. That was that was just the time. He had a couple of joints, believe it or not. And uh, yeah. <laughs> you know what's funny, real? Quick, I remember uh, Joe Button was doing a freestyle, and and, and he he got he referenced MC Brains in, in a, in a kind of like a you know he sung them. But the, uh, this really? is a side note. It was just kind of funny. But when you think about it, it's kind of like a stupid name. <laughs> and I remember when I bought the single because I think the the song was called like. Uchi coochie la 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 something like that. Oh, it was uh, it was it was terrible, man. And uh, Joe yeah, Bunch, Joe, Joe Bunch actually said, "Yo, I'm trying to be an MC with brains. Y'all niggas is MC brains. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh man, you know, 
So you take this for what it's worth. But it, but anyway, you know, Dupree had his hand in so much. And I would even challenge the listeners, you know, don't just take what we're saying at face value. You know, after you listen to this podcast tonight, if you get a few minutes where you're playing around online, Google Jermaine Dupree and look at his discography. And when I tell you, you're going to actually be absolutely amazed at not just the R&B he had his hand in, but the hip hop also. You're going to say, oh, he produced that song? Oh, he wrote that song? Yeah, we're talking about a multi-talented individual who is a writer and a producer. Jermaine Dupree can make beats. He can write songs. He used to dance. You know what I'm saying? He, yeah. he did all of these things, and we clown him. Like, like I remember when he was dating Janet Jackson, who was like, well, how the hell did Jermaine Dupree get Jan- Janet Jackson? Well, he's Jermaine Dupree. You know what I'm saying? So you're looking, at like, yeah, you're looking at him like, oh, he's not, you know, Shamar Moore or some shit, I'll be sure. But you forget that he's Jermaine Dupree. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So he, he even helped bring her back out again uh, with that Demita Joe, I believe, album or something like this. So we're talking about someone who has elevated so many careers in black culture, whether it's hip hop or RB, so whatever the case may be. And hip hop heads. When we name our favorite producers, for example, we never name Jermaine Dupree. This is the reason why I wrote the article Herbert Lovebug a few months ago because we never named Herbie. And now we never ma- named Jermaine Dupree. Well, his name, you have to look at him on that big level when you think of these Pharrells and Swiss Beats and all that. I know you're thinking that, no, he can make beats. He produced a lot of work. You know what I'm saying? He, he helped usher in Atlanta. Imagine hip hop without So So Deaf Records. Imagine mm-hmm. Atlanta hip hop without Jermaine Dupree. Do we get the Outcast, Organized Noise, the whole Dungeon family in the same vein? Do we get, you know, T.I. a couple of years later and Ludacris, you know what I'm saying, and Goody Mob and all of these people? Maybe you get them, maybe you don't. Maybe it looks different. Maybe, you know, Atlanta hip hop don't pop off early 90s and then really elevate with Outcast by the time. ATL is, you know, come out of some some play. Listen, maybe it happens, but it happens four or five years later. You know, yeah. so maybe a longer delay in the evolution of Atlanta hip hop. If Jermaine Dupri doesn't become what he became, you know what I'm saying? Because it's easy now. We're looking back, but what if he never popped off? Atlanta hip hop might be the same, not be the same, and hip hop might not be the same because we have to remember. After Outkast start popping off, and then you get the T.I.s and the Lou and all these guys later, Atlanta had a strong hold on hip hop for several years. I mean, you had your time where Jay Z, Nas, and everyone was mm-hmm. still putting out good music, and then the rise of Kanye and the Midwest and stuff like that. After the West Coast kind of got quiet for a while, but I mean, like I said, if you think about it, maybe it's totally different if that don't pop off, and maybe Atlanta artists don't pop off for four or five more years because Jermaine Dupree didn't set the blueprint and the groundwork for them to have that yeah. avenue for, 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 for outcasts to even go to the source of wars and say, the South got something to say, it's all I got to say. Well, the South had something to say four years before that with Jermaine Dupree. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's true. That's true. And it's probably young cats that will say, and I mean, I wouldn't argue it uh, to a point, um, that you know, Atlanta kind of running now with with Future and, and Migos and stuff like that. Absolutely, you can um, say that. I, yeah, you know what I'm saying. I think I think one thing to point out is, um, and and this was probably more more prevalent back in the days than it is now because um, it's not like a shock or people aren't blindsided by where somebody's from, uh, but. But back then, you know, everybody was trying to put their city on the map. Like, that was the thing. It was the same thing in New York. From early hip-hop days, when it seemed like everybody was from the Bronx or Uptown, and, you know, to get to get a Brooklyn anthem was an achievement. To get Big Daddy Kane to emerge out of Brooklyn amongst KRS-One and Shan and Queens and, and Rakim and, like, to get Big Daddy King was a big deal. Same thing with the West Coast. To get some of their legends was a big deal. And 
and you don't and shit even the ghetto boys and scarface and all of them you know down in texas like jermaine dupree was the first time we looked at atlanta the standard for where they from and jermaine dupree was doing that was so so deaf it was like you know it, it wasn't boom bat new york or philly or anything like that it wasn't west coast gangster rap or nothing. it was totally different and i think that's why some people when they rate producers i think that's why they don't ever bring them up because it's different like at least with gangster rap and boom bat they both have a hard edge to them as far as their sound you know what i'm saying so it's easy to be like Oh, on the West Coast, that's they hip hop. It, it, but it's it's the same vibe, you know what I'm saying? Still grimy, just in a different way. But Atlanta joint had a bounce. There was some smoothness to it. There was a, a rhythm to it. Like like dudes will always tell me it's from Atlanta, you know, music to ride to and stuff like that. Um, so for other places, they're not really great in those beats as much as they're just great in the overall song. So Jermaine Dupri just looks like a dude that's in the video to most people. When we all know that ain't the case. <laughs> like Tone yeah. said, he writing, yeah, he, he producing, coming up with the gimmicks and everything. Yeah, you know what? That's why I always appreciated whenever I saw Jermaine Dupri actually rhyming or doing something in a song because he deserved that shine because for a lot of years, he was in the background. You didn't even realize he was writing and producing these songs for all these different artists. You know what I'm saying? Because he was in the cut. So he wasn't trying to be over famous, I guess, in front of the camera like that. And this is also from his perspective. So So Def started in 1993. So So Def is still an active record label 26 years later. And just for you guys to know, if you didn't know, there were 31 albums released on So So Def records. And that's not counting mm -hmm. Jermaine Dupri fully producing you know, Emancipation of Mimi for Mariah Carey and, and My Way for Usher and Confessions for Usher and all these other artists, that's not even counted in those 31 albums. These are just the albums that's on yeah. his label and so, so deaf. And just another side note, me being from North Carolina, you know, yes, Jermaine Dupri is linked with Atlanta. He was born in Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, as a kid, he was here and then he moved to Atlanta and was raised pretty much the rest of his life in Atlanta. So that's just a little North Carolina pride for you, as there's a lot of great musicians that were born in, in North Carolina from John Coltrane, Thelonious Monk, to a whole lot of other guys are North Carolinians. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we'll take pride in that. Uh, but, and also with uh, Anthony Hamilton being from Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, he also rocked with So So Def. Several albums released on So So Def, including his debut, the debut classic uh, after he became famous, coming where, where I'm from is a so so deaf record you know what i'm saying so those yeah. are just all the tidbits for you guys to just understand the the impact the brand functified is the first female hip-hop album to go platinum you know that's a yeah. big deal we're talking about before her you had mc light you had queen latif for moni love you had roxanne shantay you had all of these dope mcs they were platinum artists they were gold artists you know what I'm yeah. saying? So, some of them had some platinum singles, but the Brat in 1994, if I'm not mistaken, Fuck the is the first platinum album by a female MC. Yeah. And that's the name the priest's hand is on that. He produced that. He worked with the Brat. He helped mold her. Uh, so that's just another thing where he not only was working with child stars, she was working with you know this female MC. Don't get me wrong when I say female MC. She's an MC first. You know what I mean? I, mm. I, I you know, I know she's a female, but that's just for perspective. Uh, it just shows you again, you know, his vision of what hits could be. You know, he who make club bangers, who make songs that you can ride to for his artists. I think he found a way to make songs that made sense for the artists he was working with. Nothing sounds forced. Uh, I think the brat, the way she rhymed and the way her appearance was, I think it matched. He didn't make Criss Cross trying to be hardcore as kids. He had songs, I missed the bus. You know what I'm saying? I like the video yeah. going on the bus going to school. You know what I'm saying? Criss Cross make you jump. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, tonight's the night. They Their lyrics fit their look. It wasn't forced. It wasn't like when you think of other child 
MCs, and I'll say this funny enough, from like New York. When you had Shaheen, the rugged child at 12, rhyming with Biggie and Pac on freestyle, I was talking about getting people up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or, or Malik, and, Malik and Jamal illegal. You know what I'm saying? Or, you know, Ali oh, Vegas. And, you know what I'm saying? And A plus from, I think he's from uh, like Long Island, the Hempstead or somewhere. I mean, you got these younger guys in hip hop and they were more aggressive, like the New York aggressive young hip hop. Well, crisscross was fun. You know what I'm saying? They were, yeah. they, I missed the bus, man. You know, that, that's all, I, you know, that, that comes to mind. So I think, again, Jermaine Dupree, even with Bow Wow, Bow Wow had little fun songs when he was a little kid. You know what I'm saying? He, you know, and, and he made it so other young kids could listen to and appreciate Bow Wow. That's why Bow Wow was having sold out shows. You know what I'm saying? Because it made sense. And I, and I think that Jermaine Dupree never overdid it. I think he never forced any artist to be something that they probably work in general as a person or group, you know, escape. I think he did a great job with, you know, they, they had the first album on So So Death. You know what I'm saying? I think it fit what they were trying to do, the Jagged Edge and, you know, the wedding song, Let's Get Married. I mean, this, this guy, man, you know what I'm saying? Again, I was listening to the B-side with Biggie and Puff and everyone earlier today riding, riding into the crib. And I was like, wow, Jermaine Dupree really was in the mix, man. Yeah, he was, he was, he was big time, man. Like, and I think I think a lot of people who grew up around that time probably when you when you lay this all out and you start to talk about some of those records that you know maybe don't hit the radio all the time in every market, um, like money and the thing, then you start to remember like, damn, Jermaine Dupri was like with everything that was going on in that time as far as hits and getting money and the videos having bigger budgets. Jermaine Dupree and So So Def was right there, collaborating, matching, beating certain artists. And, you know, it was just one of those things where, um, again, when you step back and you look at it, you know, you got to have a level of appreciation for him. And I, I just kind of went through real, uh, like real quick just to see, like, all right, so what is he doing now? Now, we know that um, So So Def celebrated 25 years in the business uh in january of 2019 uh they did like a little tour uh, of shows or whatever but jermaine dupree continues to work with mariah carey he did a song with chris brown recently he worked with uh dj khaled um and these credits are producer composer um he done work with will uh weird al yankovic i didn't even know that it was still alive like <laughs> Uh, doing a lot with uh, Mariah Carey, Ty Dolla Sign, like Jermaine Dupri continues to put in work, and it's just that he's not as visible as he once was. You know what I'm saying? Like back then, he was all in the videos, dancing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like Suge right. Knight said, but um, now he he just does what he does, and again, similar to Puff. So so deaf and bad boy exist. They still like you know Rockefeller's gone and Rough Rod is basically gone and bad boy. You wouldn't even know that you know somebody like Janelle uh, Janelle Mo, uh, Janelle Monet is on that. You know what I'm saying? She's on Bad Boy Records. You wouldn't even know that so so deaf was still in the mix because it's it's not as in your face like it was back then but right. that's sign of a successful business like tone said what was it 93 yeah when so so death started yep 1993 like you know what i'm saying and he's still here he's still doing things under that imprint still putting out hits collaborating with big artists when you when you're still collaborating with major artists now who really wouldn't even have to go to you because they're already big. That says a lot about your pedigree in this business and and your ability to get results as far as hits go. Uh, to have a Chris Brown or a DJ Khaled or whatever feel like I need to mess with Jermaine Dupree yep. on this. Yep. Uh, 
Like everything is there. And then you press play on the music. Because a lot of times when you go and learn about someone and then you press play, you have the context that we have. Because there are a lot of people, you know, he wasn't born around that time. Or maybe he was a baby when Jermaine Dupri was popping. You know, and maybe all you know of Jermaine Dupri is, you know, when he worked with Mariah Carey or the fact he was dating Janet Jackson. But that is not the man we talking about. We talking about a man who has put in years of work in this business and in hip hop and definitely needs to be saluted for doing so. So it is what it is. But how do you feel about Jermaine Dupri? Leave your comments in the comment section below. We love to know, you know, don't be afraid if you've never liked him or any of his music, it's fine. You could say so, express your opinion. It's a judgment free zone. We're here to talk it out, debate it, whatever the case may be. Uh, leave your comments in the comment section below. Now we get to a point in the show though, where uh, we like to recommend to you something you should go back and listen to. And my recommendation kind of stays in that lane somewhat of so sonically of the type of music so so deaf sound like when it came to hip hop. It's Snoop Dogg's 2004 album, Rhythm and Gangster. Now, recently on his channel, I did a tier list of Snoop Dogg albums that just dropped today. Um, and I talked about this album, but I'm gonna say the same thing I said on there. When I heard that Snoop was doing an album called Rhythm and Gangster, with most of the production being done by Pharrell, I was kind of like, I don't want it. I don't yeah. want an R&B version of Snoop Dogg. Like, nah, you know what I'm saying? I was like, I don't want it. I liked the song Beautiful from the right. album previously. It was a hit. It was dope. The pairing was great. But I was like, now you're talking about doing multiple songs and I'm kind of overdue a Dr. Dre and Snoop pairing, what's going on? And I remember my man, Zach, shout out to Zach, kept telling me, this was like after the album had been out, kept telling me, nah, you need to listen to this. It's, it's cool, it's like grown man Snoop. And not that every song on there is a jam and that you won't hit the skip button because there's a lot of records on there. But man, the records that he, him and Pharrell put together it's another good pairing, like Snoop and Dre. It's, it's a different pairing, but right. Snoop and Pharrell are just as good. Like, they make some really good music together. Um, and it's an album I frequently go back to, man. So definitely check that out. It's called Rhythm and Gangsta, Snoop album, Snoop Dogg album from 2004, um, you know, before he was just Instagram king. <laughs> Uh, but it's definitely worth your time. But again, if you're looking for doggy style, even if you're looking for blue carpet treatment, this is not it. This no. is Pharrell. This is a, there's a little bit of clips Pharrell in there on some of the beats, and then there's a lot of Pharrell and Snoop beautiful style beats. And to yeah. be honest, those are my, my favorite records on there, man. It's real smooth. Charlie Wilson's on there. I love it. So, uh, Tone, what did you think about that album, and what's your recommendation? You know, I wasn't really mad at it because Snoop is one of those few hip hop artists that he has something for everyone, man. You know what I'm saying? If you want the hardcore joints late in his career, the blue carpet treatment was that. You know, to remind you of Doggy Style and the Chronic, etc. But the art, the rhythm, and the rhythm joint is, I think, it's smooth with the production. I think that Pharrell and Snoop has, like you said, probably the second best chemistry outside of him and Drake, potentially. You know what I mean? And it mm -hmm. seems to work. Uh, they've made club bangles. They've made nice B-side type tracks. You know what I'm saying? Not mad at it, man. It has some good joints on them. I haven't heard it in a while, but, I, you know, again, Pharrell understands music. I think he understood what would work for the smooth tone of, of Snoop voice. You know what I'm saying? I don't, you know, the good thing is I don't think he overproduced the tracks, uh, Snoop was still able to shine and sound good and sound like Snoop, even though it was more laid back and some of the drums was more, you know, of course, jazzy and, and R&B type of flavor. But not mad at it, man. It's another good project in Snoop's 
very diverse uh catalog, man. You know what I'm saying? So not mad at it. Uh I like it. For my, my recommendation this week is 2014 EP Beauty and the Beast by North Carolina's own Rhapsody. Just real quick, Rhapsody mm. has done a great job in her career. Shout out to Rhapsody, ninth wonder, everyone here in North Carolina just doing great for Jamma Records. She has a new album coming out in a couple of weeks called Eve. From what they tell me, from what people tell me, this is the game changer. If you thought Layla's Wisdom would, had a Grammy night was was big, they said this one is a game changer. I haven't talked tonight. I haven't heard it. This one of our mutual friends told me that, so maybe we'll rap and he'll let me hear I haven't heard it yet. But they say it's something special. But anyway, back to Beauty and the Beast, this was one of the ones when I was like, okay, so she really is spitting like this. You know what I'm saying? It's 10 tracks yeah. produced by the Soul Council within Jamma Records. Uh, oh, my God, man. I'm just looking at some of it right now. Hip Hop DX gave it four stars. You know, you have Ninth. You got Knotts, who is a Virginia producer, who is uh, obviously, if you don't know about Knotts, he's one of the best beat makers in hip hop and been that way for a long time. Uh, but, yeah, mostly mostly uh, Ninth and Crisis, Eric G and Knotts. She has a song on there on Beauty of the Beast I really enjoy called Hard to Choose, uh, produced by Knife. Uh, man, it, it just she has a one called The Man, produced by Eric G. It's kind of like a story about, you know, the relationship between men and women and fathers and daughters and how society, how black men sometimes because of poverty and systematic racism can, can put a, a strain on the relationship with the with the women, you know what I'm saying? It's called The Man, how hard it is to be a black man in America. She really touched me with that song because as a writer, it was very poetic to me and the storytelling was very vivid and thought provoking, man. And that's what Rhapsody has done on this on this Beauty and the Beast project and a lot of other projects. I remember hearing this and thinking it was so dope. I ran a knife at a, at a spot in Raleigh because we do a, it's a party called 95 Live that knife do every month. And we ran into each other, and I said, dude, that Beauty and the Beast, he just grabbed me and said, dog, is it, is it not dope? And I said, y'all hit a home run with that one, man. I said, y'all hit a home run with that one, and I'm telling everybody about it. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, if you want to hear some dope hip-hop uh, listeners, go back and check out Rhapsody's 2014 EP. I call it an album because it's 10 songs. Hell, Illmatic had nine songs. But anyway, um, 10 yeah. tracks this man check it out beauty and the beast rhapsody man that's my recommendation man yeah have you ever heard that joint of a i own it that okay. is one of my favorite that's one of my favorite rhapsody joints man those are those are the types of projects that she have that for people who are on the fence about her or never heard of her um that i'm like listen to this listen to this listen to mm -hmm. this um because like you said man one thing I like about Rhapsody is um, she she can make a song about a relationship, whether it's coming from a woman's perspective or like you say, you know, um, breaking down, you know, how a man's relationship is affected by the world and how that affects his relationship with a woman or a black woman in particular. She knows how to make those types of records without him mm -hmm. seeming preachy or boring or or for one sex versus the other she's really good at that she's done it numerous times on several projects um and i never felt like oh i don't want to hit this one you know what i'm saying um so yeah man that that ep is one i haven't listened in a minute um but it's definitely worth going back to um so check those out man it's rhapsody snoop dogg Two very dope projects. Hit that subscribe button if you just like it. Hit the like button. If you got something to say, leave your comments in the comment section below. Please know that this podcast is not only available in video form on YouTube. All you got to do is search for the B-Roll Network. That's B-R-O-L-E Network. Uh, but also available in audio form. And you can find the video and the audio on IntoTheDome.com or just go to your if you're looking for the audio, just go to your favorite podcasting app and type in the words Hip Hop Now Podcast, and you will find within the same feed of other podcasts on there is that time in hip hop. And we've done 
almost 40 episodes. So it's a lot of hip hop. It's a lot of nostalgia, memory lane from all of that. So get locked in, stay updated. Uh, on behalf of the homie Tone of IntoTheDome.com and myself, Vegas of Hip Hop Now podcast, go out and support real hip hop. Peace. Peace. Drop, drop it on the random. <laughs>